The program originally scheduled for this time will not be heard. First-hand observations from the Western Front by Mutual's War Front correspondent, Arthur Mann. Mr. Mann is an American newspaper writer affiliated with the St. Louis Dispatch. His report, which you are about to hear, was recorded on the Western Front, where Mr. Mann has been assigned to the British and French forces and was flown to London for transmission to our New York studios. As Mr. Mann makes his observations from the war zone, naturally a censorship prevails. We take you now to London. Meet Lieutenant General W.G. Linsell, Quartermaster General of the British Army in France, and hear the story he told me of how he and his department are feeding, provisioning, and munitioning the personnel of the British Field Force. That job began before a single combatant soldier had left Great Britain. There came to France an advanced army of dock workers and superintendents, railway engineers, and motor transport experts. Road and rail communications, some hundreds of miles long, had to be worked out. Huge landing and storage bases had to be organized for handling the supplies to follow. The men who did this job had done the same work in peacetime. Now, in army uniform, they did and are doing it under war conditions. Then came the mass migration from Britain to France of the British Field Army, with its thousands upon thousands of tons of every kind of supplies needed by men for both peace and war. In two weeks, that army had moved up to the forward zone of the British sector in France. The thousands of motor vehicles employed, if placed on one road at close intervals, would cover a distance of 40 miles. They consumed 650 tons of gasoline a day. 90,000 tons of food, petrol, ammunition, and other supplies a month had and have to be brought from Britain and moved forward to the army to keep it in physical and fighting trim. As a matter of fact, supplies at the rate of 150,000 tons a month have been moved from Britain to France some weeks in order to build up a substantial reserve. So efficient has this service of supply been operated that when the fighting units first reached their advanced positions, they had three days supply of food and 500 tons of gasoline over and above the normal daily rations in hand. Now there has been built up a 38 days reserve of food and an extremely large one of ammunition. To handle these vast mountains of stores of all sorts, the Quartermaster General's Department is completing the construction of huge supply bases somewhere in France. Each covers 15 square miles. These bases will be networked by a standard gauge railway system for feeding the material collected there to the French railways and motor transport columns running up to the British Army zone. Supplies flow into the bases from various French ports. From one comes gasoline, from another food, from a third ammunition, and from still others, the multitudinous stores to meet the soldiers' combatant and non-combatant needs. It is a job which the French army does not have to do. The French, in wartime as in peace, draw everything they need from their own country in which they are operating. The British import everything, except a certain amount of fresh vegetables and, for the time being, some bread. The QMG's department also has the job of providing for the men's extra comforts. It has already established 41 canteens throughout the army zone. They look very much like the old-fashioned American Country Crossroads General Store. There the soldiers do their shopping for the little luxuries of life which are not issued to them by the war office. Tobacco, chocolate, canned food products, beer, groceries, minor articles of apparel, and so forth. Incidentally, this transport job is being done with a breakdown incidence of but one-third of one percent of the thousands of motor trucks and vans employed. This low rate is extremely important in view of the fact that the Army transport system has to handle one-third of a ton per month per man of supplies for the Army, exclusive of the reserves which are being built up. Another job which the Quartermaster General's Department has to handle, in cooperation with the British Post Office, is that of getting the correspondence of officers and men to and from Great Britain. Letters now get from Britain to the Army in between four and five days. The return journey takes a little longer, partly because letters from the Army to Britain are naturally censored. The mail of officers and men is treated exactly alike. A unique test of the efficiency of the military mail service was made the other day. The British Assistant Postmaster General got himself sent as a letter from London to the British Army here. It took four days to deliver him. 
He went back as a passenger because he refused to pass through the censorship department for outgoing mail. One problem of modern war which has to be tackled, or had to be tackled, was the problem of lethal gas in connection with the Army's food. This has been solved by having a certain portion of the basic rations canned so that it will always reach the men free of contamination should the supply bases or columns be subjected to gas attacks. One problem remains which the Quartermaster General will tackle at the proper time. If and when active warfare breaks out on the British front and wet weather intervenes, the Army's mechanical transport may have to be sub supplemented by horses and mules. Here is where America will play a part in British operations, for the United States would undoubtedly be one of the sources of supply for British Army mules. Other sources would be South America and Spain. During the rain and snow of the winter months and the thaw of the early spring, the British motor transport could continue to operate on the main roads out here. But the secondary roads, side roads, and cart tracks might become impassable for wheeled mechanical transport and here is where the good old army mule would play its part again, as it did in so many past wars. At present, however, there is no horse or mule transport with the British Army in France. This question of animal transport is important, because with it, without it, a war of movement would be impossible during wet and muddy months, except on the main roads. Now just a word about a rival quartermaster general's operation, which I witnessed a few days ago. The bunch of us were up in the forward area of the British sector, following an inspection visit of General Lord Gort, British Commander-in-Chief. While we were awaiting his arrival at one little town, Ed Angley, New York Herald Tribune correspondent here, offered to buy some chocolate for a few kids who would stop to look at us on their way back to school after lunch. The news of this piece of supply work flashed through the town, and as Ed started for the little store which was the supply base, 150 or so kids beamed after him. Ed would probably still be feeding those youngsters if the school bell hadn't rung for them. We dubbed Ed the Pied Piper of... Sorry, folks, but the censor just reminded me we mustn't mention place names. I saw today God's troops who had just spent several days and nights in the trenches in the British sector in France. They went into those trenches as spick and span as only the guards can look. Now they are mud-stained and caked, and hollow-eyed from lack of sleep, but with the guards' jauntiness still apparent. A few weeks ago, the sugar beet and cabbage fields along this part of the British front lay untroubled by the hand of the military. Today, behind the chain of French-built blockhouses and anti-tank defenses, lines of trenches zigzag their way through sticky clay. Duck boards and fire steps give the feet some protection against the inevitable groundwater which collects on the earth floor. Every few yards there is a small dugout. In each of these I saw stretched out on wooden pallets woven from thin branches, five or six men sleeping off the fatigue of their night vigil and toil. The sentries have been doing one hour tricks at night and two hours during the day. At night, the no smoking order is strictly enforced. Only the men off duty in the dugouts may smoke. The sentries by day stare out toward the frontier in the direction from which an attacking enemy would appear. Nearby is a machine gun, an anti-tank rifle, and ammunition boxes. On the other side of him is a gas detector. Ordinary rifles lean against the trench walls. Walking ahead of the little inspection party, I rounded the angle of the trench line and came suddenly on a sentry. With a shout of halt, he half raised his rifle and then grounded it as he recognized his major coming up behind me. In the dugouts and occasionally in the trenches are coke burning braziers to cut the damp chill of France at this time of the year. Some of the braziers were improvised from empty gasoline tins, and the same utensil <coughs> were being used to boil water for the tea which helps carry, carry the British soldier through this sort of thing. In the line, some of the cooking is done in the dugouts in the, <coughs> in the front line. Meat, 
and potatoes for their midday meal. Elsewhere, I saw stacked in the dugout raisins which had been brought up from the regular cookhouse in big insulated food containers. The men are working continuously to improve the forward defensive system, not only strategically, but also from the standpoint of comfort. Small branches cut from nearby woods are woven into watering walls to line the trenches. The trench floor area covered by duckboards grows daily. When there is too much water to permit their use, the trenches are dug wider toward the top so that an earthen sidewalk can be cut in the wall above the water level. Knee-high rubber boots are in great demand by the working party. In the woods nearby, soldiers had just finished clearing out all the underbrush and saplings to give a clear field of fire for the anti-tank and machine guns of one of the blockhouses. It was flooded with rainwater, and the men had to hack and saw away in several feet of water. Overhead, an army cooperation plane was flying back and forth, taking photographs of the groundworks. These pictures are being used to assist the officers who are responsible for camouflage work. Incidentally, there was an air raid warning during the inspection. While tin-hatted troops with gas masks worn at the alert manned the anti-aircraft guns, and the men off duty were ordered into the dugouts and trenches. The local French civilians ran out of farm buildings and factories in the vicinity to look on, apparently indifferent to the possibility that enemy planes might appear. But none did. The amount of sheer brute physical work and sweat which has gone into the making of this front in the last three weeks, for six days a week, has been tremendous. Sundays have so far been free from digging. Strangely enough, to us civilians who have difficulty in analyzing the sensations of such a life, the men appear to prefer this toiling activity to sitting around wondering when the war will begin in earnest. It gives them less time also to think about the physical discomfort in which they are living and of the lost days at home. By the time the back of this work has been broken, the war officer's mechanism for entertainment for the troops off duty will have begun to function regularly. On the way up to the front, we came upon the headquarters of a former cavalry unit, now an armored car outfit. These cars are used for fast reconnaissance work and are capable of speed which will enable them to retire rapidly should they encounter tanks, against which they are not, not supposed to operate. One of the officers offered to take me a few miles on the road toward my destination. We drove along in one of these many-ton vehicles at a speed much faster than I care for, even in a car built for pleasure motoring. Part of the time, we were in communication with another armored car some distance behind us through our radio telephone. I was glad to return to one of the headquarters cars. Incidentally, these latter cars, which are being used at both Army and Royal Air Force headquarters, are the product of the British subsidiary of the General Motors Corporation. Good night and thank you.